So where next? So now you dial the number. Right. And so, well, let me grab a butt set and we can look at the OR. So, so, so we go off hook and we'll hear the dial tone marker do its do its thing, which is right in front of so us here. This is just a line. It's just a line. We yeah. It's just okay. multiple around, so gotcha. we can got something to play with. Gotcha. Basically. Yeah. There you are. You heard the dial tone marker. So we'll dial a call. Okay, we're on this OR here. Um, you'll see. Um, a few things you will see. Uh, where are we? Okay, so this set of, we have a set of relays here we're looking at. Those are the relays that are going to count the pulses. Right. Okay. And so that's the first thing you'll see. The other thing you'll see is these are the steering relays and they'll operate in sequence as we dial each digit. And they are what directs the digit as you dial it into these storage so relays. Like, like first digit, second digit, third yeah, digit? So, yeah, they operate in this rather odd sequence. But basically, I've dialed the first three. Okay, you see. Oh, we went from yeah. that one to this yes. one. Yes. I'll have to see the next one. There we go. And now if you watch this set of relays here, you'll see it counting. Okay, now I've dialed all but the last digit, and when I dial the last digit, um, we'll hear the completing marker do its thing, which is right behind us here. Aha! Uh -huh. And there we go. All right. Yeah. So, um, and then and then you'll see the um, you'll see the um, the release sequence of the OR. Um, we were talking earlier about the, the noises that you hear when it cuts through. Yes. And uh, sort of the two step, the first step being the release of the OR, the tip and ring to the OR, and the second step being you connect it to the trunk. And so there's a couple of relays that we're looking at here in the OR that actually do that. I forget which way round they are. I, I think this is the first one. There's a relay here called MRL, and that relay is operated by the marker when it wants to um, disconnect tip and ring from the OR, but still leave the OR connected to the marker. And there's a second relay, RL. I think that's which way round they are. Um, and that's the one that finally, the marker finally operates when it says, okay, we're, we're good here. I really don't need you anymore. Gotcha. Um, and another interesting variant of that is we can try and make a call that requires a second trial, and we should see one of the relays operate first. Then the marker will make the second trial, and finally it will force the OR to return the uh, reorder tone. So we may or, not, may or may not see that other relay operate. Anyway, let's try to put us through a call, and we'll, we'll watch the relays and see what happens. All right. uh, I, want, I want to try and get this one because it's much easier to see. That's the one right at the top. Uh, which relay should we watch? We should watch probably. Oh, let's do the bottom one. If you don't want to bend down, we can take a look at this maybe. Okay, so these are the two relays in question. Oh, we got a better one. Okay, here we go. So it's okay. It's these two here. So let's watch these two. Okay, this one first, then that one. Did you notice I the did. sequence? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, let's try it again. Sorry. There we go. We got this one. Ta da! Huh? <laughs> Way cool. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So um, so yeah. So the 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 ORs they have a little bit of smarts in them in that they all they will they will know how many digits to expect on calls. Um, Do you have a pre-translator? No, we don't have pre-translators. And in fact, the wire spring markers have a little bit more of that kind of intelligence built into them. So in a lot of cases, you didn't need a pre-translator. The pre-translator is mostly a 
flat spring. You mostly use for flat spring uh, crossbar offices, I believe. Hmm. Who uh, who tells Mr. O R to go through when somebody dials four one one? Um, so it it has a, a primitive translation capability. So ah, okay. so I think I I believe the way these were wired was X one one was set up just to take three digits. Well, we could spell two one one. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> or you know six one one. Yeah. Um, I, I, there's, there's, there's some cross connects you can do here that um, allow you to look at the digits. So I think these are wired so X11 in general would, would um, bring in the marker. Aha, uh -huh, okay. It also looks at the, um, it can look at the second digit, so if the second digit is a 0 or 1, yeah, it can okay. assume an area code and wait for the, the 10 digits. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and there was also a capability, and um, I think I think we have that option. This is an electronic timer here, um, so you could say at least on certain calls you could say delay to see if you get any more digits. Yeah, and the manual with party line digit days in New York, they had those. Yes, yeah, they called it the station's delay, where you have to wait to see if there was a station digit. Now here you afterwards. might have that with a dialing zero, I guess is the only modern use Yes, that. yeah, and in fact if we dial zero and just wait a couple of seconds, um, give it a few, yeah. 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 Didn't like that. Yeah, well, we, no, don't, have a, we don't have a route set up for that yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so as you heard, it, it, it calls in the marker, uh, it calls it in via the connector. We can go and look at the connector in a little bit and watch the second trial, but the marker here, it's, it's about 1,500 relays. It occupies four bays. One of, them, one of the bays is mostly cross-connect. Um, if we look, okay, so here, uh, there's this... Uh, Terminal strip marked C, which stands for code. It's in two places, 000 through 499. And there's another C uh, somewhere. Here it is, C uh, 500 through 999. And there's a relay tree that translates the first three digits that are presented to the marker and puts a ground on one of these 1,000 terminals. And that's the route. And that's the route. That's how it, yeah. I mean, a lot of them are just strapped together because the, tr the treatment is the same. You know, if you're going to a distant area code, it's all the same. Now, a route is going to imply a trunk group and an alternate, an overflow possibility, mm -hmm. too. Well, it's actually a little bit more interesting than that because this is five crossbar, so it has to be a little bit more interesting. Um, when, when you dial those, those first three digits will ground one of those 1,000 code points. Uh, but the treatment of the call has to vary depending on whether it's coming from... Oh, class of service. Class of service, yes. okay. Oh, goodness me, yes. Uh, so we have uh, a group of relays that is actually this group up here. Um, what, what actually happens is the... Um, the code point is cross-connected to, uh, to another terminal, which is actually down here. It goes through some intermediate steps, which are really just wires for convenience of uh, cross-connects. But it ends up on a series of contacts on multiple class of service relays. And one of those will be operated for each different class of service. Uh, so what happens is the ground from our code point will go through contacts of the class of service relays. So if we're making, let's say, an intra-office call, it might go through the contacts of one relay to one route, um, the contacts of another relay to a separate route, but the ultimate uh, goal here is we're going to operate one route relay for each different type of class of service. Okay. And it's the route relay, it's cross connections on the route relay that determine what type of trunk is then used. So it might be a flat rate 
intra-office trunk. It might be a message rate intra-office trunk, which uh, is one which... Each of those is a different route relay. Yeah. Uh, uh, the message rate would operate the, um, the message register on successful calls. Right. Or it might be a, an intra-office coin trunk, which is capable of dealing with all the coin collect functions of your call and dealing with overtime if that's provisioned in the particular office. Right. Um, but ultimately, it, it selects a trunk group. And then once it's done that, um, the operation is, is very much the same as that which we described for the dial tone marker. Um, it has, once the root relay is operated, the root relay um, will switch through the leads. And the, the root relay is a big 30 contact multi, multi contact relay. Okay. So that switches through the busy idle leads that tell for each trunk link frame whether or not that trunk link frame has idle trunks of the appropriate type uh, on okay. it. Right. And that's all determined by various cross connections. So all the trunks of one root and one type are cross-connected together to this contact on the root relay. So that if any one of them is available, yes. it will say, hello. Right, yes, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. And again, we or get... Or actually, if any one of them is busy, it will say, uh-uh. It's, yeah. it's, it's more negative, right? Well, no, it's, it's, positive. it's positive. We get a ground if it's idle. So, so if... Okay. So if, if ground if it's idle. See, in other, in other places, ground means busy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you think about it, if, if, um, if open circuit was to mean idle and you've got a broken wire, that wouldn't be so good. Yeah, yeah. Everything would go there. Yes, <laughs> yes. right. Um, so now it, it knows, and it also has the frame busy leads from the trunk link frame, so it knows which trunk link frames are in use by other markers. Right. And again, it has the sequence circuit, so it will try and equalize the traffic amongst all the trunk link frames. Um, all that goes into the meat grinder, right. and it selects the trunk link frame, and then once it's done that, the trunk link connector now presents the busy idle information from each trunk that's on that frame. So it, it selects a particular trunk. Um, oh, all right. And now it knows, because it's been passed the information from the OR, it knows the location of the calling line. So it can go out now and it can seize that line link frame. So now it has the line link frame, it has the trunk link frame, it also has all the test leads now to know which junctors are free and busy, and much as within, as well, it's exactly the same circuit, I guess, as the dial tone marker. It goes through and it operates the, um, the select and horizontal magnets. It also does that continuity test that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, once it's done all that and it's happy, it can release the OR and you'll be switched through to the trunk. Yeah, that's got to do the callback at and now, the same yeah, time, right? It does, well, it does that first. It does the calling side. Well, I, I guess what I described is the callback, yeah, which yeah, is actually the second part of the operation. Okay, right. uh, on an intra-office call, uh, it actually does what's called the forward linkage first. And for that, it has to go out to the number group, uh, which is this bay right on the end here. Um, so when the marker recognizes an intra-office call, um, it will connect to a number group frame. A number group frame is basically a lookup table. The input to this table is the telephone number. The output is the location, the coordinates of that number. So it's which line link frame that number is located on. Uh, which vertical group, which horizontal group, and which vertical file. And from that, it can pinpoint the exact location of the, uh, of the number that you're calling. So with that information, the marker can seize uh, the line link frame. Remember, it's actually already got the trunk link frame because it used the, uh, its, its mechanism to figure out where there's a free intra-office trunk and seize that frame. It can then seize the line link frame and it can set up the forward linkage. Uh, it does all its continuity tests. Once it's happy with that, it does the callback where it goes back to the calling line from the uh, calling line location information given to it from the OR. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's something that I, I always forget, that whatever linkage was used to get you the OR yeah. is abandoned yes. to get you to the trunk. Right. It doesn't go, it doesn't progress, it right. drops and makes a new one. Yeah, it's not, say, like a number one crossbar, yeah. where you have, yep. you yep. go so far and then you continue on. Yes, yeah. exactly, yep, yep, cool, very cool. Right. Uh, what's the practical number of trunks on a trunk link frame for, like, like if you're making an intra-office call, mm -hmm. And it finds a trunk link, link frame that has at least one idle trunk. What's the maximum number that can be on there? Um, the number of the number of trunks you can have uh, for any one corresponding to any one route is twenty on each trunk link frame. Twenty per trunk link frame. Yes. Okay. Now that's where life gets a little interesting because this office here, uh, the Belfast office, had, we believe, I think, eight or nine trunk link frames at the end of its life. Um, so that would imply a maximum of nine times 20, which is 180 intra-office trunks. Right. So that's, that's the number of intra-office calls that you could have up at any one time. Um, that apparently wasn't enough at Belfast. Uh-oh. So there's a number of things you can do for that. You could set up an alternate route. Um, the marker has the capability or so that if all trunks on a particular route are busy, it can set, set, set up an alternate route. But that was usually used for situations where you had uh, direct trunks to somewhere but overflow traffic might go via a tandem. Right. The other problem with that is because you always pick the primary route first, um, it's not going to distribute your wear and tear evenly amongst all your intra-office trunks. Mm, yeah, so how did they do it? How did so, they deal with it? So the, what they did was the marker had an additional facility, a route allotter it was called, um, which uh, the basic idea is on successive calls it would flip between one of two routes so now you have not one but two route relays there you go one route relay would give you 20 per right and the other route relay would give you 20 per so now you can have 40 intra office trunks on every trunk link frame and it would flip flop between the two groups so now your your yeah. wear and tear and would be roughly equal reasonably well yes. yeah 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 cool yeah, well, I always noticed that in number five crossbar that it would distribute in a very broken logic yes. kind of way. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it would sort of end up being sort of even, but not exactly. Yeah, it was it a was little never bit random. Like, it was yeah. never like um, you know one yeah. or another. You know. I mean, it would depend on on which marker you happen to get, as well as what that marker had just done for somebody else before. Yep, yep. Even in the middle of the night, it wasn't you know you wouldn't get. See, number one ESS, you would pick trunks. If you were the only person calling out, mm -hmm. you would pick those trunks in the same order. Right. All night. Right. Now, it wouldn't be, now the next night, it wouldn't exactly be the same order, but it would be the same order mm -hmm. for if you're just that one person. Right. But in five bar, it was never regular right. like that. Well, one of the things that the, the, the OR marker connector would do, there's a, basically a, flip-flop circuit in that. So on successive calls, the connector would choose a different marker. Ah, okay. So now, um, so let's say nobody else is making calls, and you made two calls. On the first call, you would be influenced by what that marker had done previously for somebody else's call. Yeah. On the second one, you would be influenced by what the second marker had done previously for somebody else's call. Aha, uh -huh. interesting. Yes. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. In this next segment, I can't manage to say the correct term, which is incoming register. First I say incoming sender, then I start saying incoming receiver. What I'm trying to say is incoming register. Martin is using the correct term. Well, you can't show me the incoming sender link and all that. Oh, working. I sure can. You can? Oh, can oh because of that? CNET? No, no. So, um... Here. That's recording again. All right. So we have we have um, incoming registers, oops, incoming registers of both dial pulse and MF, and uh, I have my trusty Sage 930 communication set connected to an incoming MF trunk. Aha! Uh -huh. So if I go off hook, 
um, you will see, uh, if you look at the LEDs on the front of the test set, you will see it wink at me. There it goes. Hey, all right. And if I hit the button here, it will send an MF sequence. Cool. <laughs> and away it goes. And uh, you can call other numbers too. Cool. So how does the... Um the incoming receiver mm -hmm. interface to the trunk, and then how does all that? How does the, how does the incoming so receiver get in there, mm -hmm. pass the information to the marker or whatever? So it's kind of like an o, it's like an OR, except there's a little bit that happens before. So when you when you go off hook on the trunk, the incoming trunk, there's a um, the, there's the sort of two connections that come out of the incoming trunk. One goes to the trunk link frame. Where, which is how it gets switched through ultimately to the line you're calling. But it's kind of a sideways connection. It's kind of like a director, if you like. There's this sort of sideways connection where the dialing of And that goes to your incoming register link. And the incoming register link has some relay logic in it, and that picks a, um, an idle incoming register and operates the crossbar switch in the register link to connect you to that register. Okay. And once that's done, the register sends the wink back. And that can take a certain amount of time, which of course is why they do the wink, so the other end knows when it can start sending. Yep. Um, and then once the wink happens, then the, the outgoing sender at the other end of the connection will start sending KP, four digits, start. And the register then knows, okay, I've got all the, all the, uh, all the stuff I need. And um, it connects to the marker in essentially the same way as the OR does. All right. And there's some leads that go that say this is an IR call rather than an OR call, for instance, so the marker does the right things. But um, it sends the number you're trying to call um, it also sends the location of the trunk link frame where the call came from. So now the marker can go and seize that trunk link frame so it can operate the right crossbar switch to do the connection. It takes the number you're trying to call and looks it up in the number group to know the line link location of the number you're trying to call. It'll go out and seize that line link frame so now it has the trunk link frame, has the line link frame, it knows the trunk on the trunk link frame, it knows the location on the line link frame, it can proceed to set up the connection in exactly the same way it would for an intra-office call. It will pick, look at all the channels to make sure it finds one that's free, it'll operate the magnets to connect that together. Uh -huh. okay. And once that's all done, the marker will retire from the connection, the connection will be held over the sleeve lead from the incoming trunk. Right. Okay. Um, give me some. Tell me something so that I can get a good picture of how the incoming sender link geography is like, and what, what that arrangement is like. Mm, I'm gonna look at one. It's different from the OR, obviously. Yeah, it is. How it gets it in there. Yeah. So. It sort of superimposes it. I get the impression. Well, it's here's here's our. This is the incoming register link. So, on the register link, the the incoming trunks are connected to the verticals on the crossbar switch. Now, does each incoming trunk have an appearance on the register link in addition to its appearance in the switching network? Yeah, yes, it does. Frame? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a two-way a so two-way thing. It's, it actually shows up here and there. Yep, that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. So it shows up on one of these verticals here, and there's 20 here and 20 here. So however many that is, is what is. Eight is it? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you can have um, up to 160 trunks can be connected through this frame. Um, when a call comes in, um, there's there's a relay. There's some relays underneath the switches here, and there's one relay for every incoming trunk that can appear on this switch. So there's okay. 160 relays here in right. this, this top part. 
So when the core comes in, it'll operate one of these, and um, then the relays at the bottom are basically the logic to do the connection. Um, so the one of these uh, trunk, they're called trunk preference relays, one per trunk, will operate. That will pick a free register. Um, the registers are on the horizontals, so the logic now will operate the select magnet corresponding to the register it picked, and then it'll, it'll operate the, the hold magnet corresponding to the trunk that's trying to make the connection. So your, your, your incoming registers are right on the horizontal, so it's just yep. one stage. It's one stage, yes. Yeah. It's not, say, like a sender link in a number one crossbar where there's a two-stage link. Okay. That I didn't know anyway. Yeah. But yeah. And in fact, there's, there's eight, eight crossbar switches here. So each one of these crossbar switches can have up to uh, 10 registers for each of the 10 horizontals. And typically, they're multipled all together. So you have a population of 160, up to 160 trunks that all have access to the same pool of uh, 10 incoming registers. And if it were a busier office, might it be 10 and 10? It might be, yeah. They, they can know, split them up if they group, want to. Group, ten, group, group A of 10, yeah. group B of 10, A, yeah. B, A, B, like that? The thing about MF registers is, um, is because the holding time of the register is so short because the signaling is so fast. Yeah. Um, then, then actually 10 registers on 160 trucks would actually probably be plenty. Okay. The situation is a little bit different with dial pulse incoming registers because the holding time is quite a bit longer. Oh, especially you've got customers, yeah, which is when you're usually going to see them is with customers. Right, yes, right. exactly. Yeah. Um, so the concentration ratio typically isn't that high. Gotcha, gotcha. And then you got to have, then, then too, you have the, um, the bi-link. The bi-link, yeah. right, <laughs> yes. So, so this one that we're looking at now is the MF1, and on the other side of this, um, this, this incoming register link here is the, uh, is the dial pulse uh, incoming register link. So how has that bi-link function occurred? I mean, what I understood was that because getting an actual sender takes time and the customer may dial right away, yeah. there's something to catch that first digit. Right even before you have a sender. Yeah, so basically the way it works is, um, again, we have uh, one relay here for every trunk, and it's, it's the same arrangement. The, the trunks are on the verticals on the crossbar switch, and the registers are on the horizontals. Um, when a call comes in from a trunk, the relay that corresponds to the trunk will operate, and um, that starts the whole logic in motion. And there's also a relay for each register, for each a register per switch. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six switches. So each, each register will have six relays. They're called the register preference relays. And um, uh, so for, the, for this switch on the bottom here, switch zero, you'll operate the trunk preference relay. And then the register preference relay will operate uh, for register zero, switch zero, let's say. All right. Once those two relays have operated, and they, they operate pretty fast, um, and there's kind of a chain, so if the first register is busy, it'll go to the second one and so on. Right. So you might not have the first register relay operate. You might have a third or fourth if some of them are busy. But once that pair of relays operates, which is milliseconds, that's what establishes the bi-link. And um, once the crossbar switch has operated, the dialing path goes through the crossbar switch. So even though those re relays release, you still have the dialing path. And that it's just so basically a wire in parallel. So but yes, almost immediate, yeah. So it doesn't take a lot of time to get an actual incoming dial pulse register on the line? Right, because the register is, is kind of ready all the time, if you think about it. It's just sitting there with battery on it, so... Yeah, okay. So as soon as, the, as, soon as those two relays operate to establish the bi-link, the... So, so, yeah, well, let's think about what's ha what has to happen to establish the bi-link. The, the two preference relays have to operate. The A relay or the L relay, whatever it's called, in the register has to operate, and the slow-release relay has to operate. 
all those, you know, so you're talking about I mean, 20 milliseconds, maybe, at the very most. Ah, okay. And then, then it can kind of take its time, as it were, to operate the crossbar switch and establish the real path. Where does the... Uh, why can it take its time? Because you've already got the, the path established through the relays. Oh, the relays... The re those two relays, when they operate, they actually carry the dialing path through to the register. So, okay, so you have a temporary link... Yes. ...that's just waiting to be activated. Right. And, but then that releases in the, the longer-term link... Yeah, the, cross the, two, the, two, the two links are in parallel, essentially. So uh -huh. the relays operate and establish the initial link. Ah, so what Bill told me was not correct. There isn't, oh. a device, there isn't a device to store the digit. There's a device to get a link immediately. Yes, yes. But you couldn't use that for more than a few milliseconds. Yeah, yeah. until the crossbar switch operates and sets up the path, yeah. Uh -huh. And that mechanism was used, I think it predates the five crossbar because I believe they used that in crossbar tandem and for a crossbar when you had incoming dial pulse circuits. You would need that some places, yeah. yes. Uh, now there's this phenomenon which used to occur that if we would seize a, uh, a dial pulse trunk into a number five crossbar and dial too fast, mm -hmm. we would get immediate reorder tone. Huh. Uh, and we always thought that was because, well, it wasn't, you know, it could only handle the first digit before it got the permanent oh, link, but no, that's not true. That is not true, and, um, and, and the, the, the permanent link is typically set up well before the first digit ends. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So I'm wondering if what you might have actually been seeing is, um, is it possible that the very first digit was actually uh, done locally and it was only the second digit that was actually going into the five crossbar maybe, or...? No, the reorder is coming from the five crossbar. It is, but okay. maybe it found dial pulsing happening as at the beginning of connecting to the sender, and and Possibly, said, oh, yeah. and said, oh, this can't be right. Yeah, it might have been something like that. If you do, if you do get it too fast, um, and one way that can happen is if there are a lot of other calls coming in, and the register link is having to deal with those first. Because there is, a, oh. there is a priority here if, if you have multiple incoming calls that arrive at exactly the same time. Um, if you do, in fact, start dialing before the buy link has set up, the incoming trunk will return reorder to That's you. That's it. That's it. It's so it was probably when the buy link was busy. It could be, and yeah. And so I, it was, it's the incoming trunk saw a dial pulsing yes. when there was not even this. Right, because there's actually a relay. Once the link has set up, there's a relay that operates in the incoming trunk. So it knows. It knows. So if it sees now It a knows pulse. the difference between this or that and nothing. The incoming trunk knows that you have some link either the temporary or the... Yeah, it doesn't distinguish. It I doesn't distinguish. Think. Yeah, it just knows, okay to pulse, not okay to pulse. That's, that's what it is then. That Probably, explains yeah. it. And I may have actually said that wrong information in one of my recordings. So oh. <laughs> I think I may have said it somewhere. Uh -oh. Oh, see, yeah. you could correct a, yeah. correct a misconception. Yeah. Well, it's... Uh, cool. It's, it's uh, interesting that... that, that that I know more than Bill about some of this stuff, although... Oh, well, you work hands-on. I do, but yeah. Bill worked hands-on as much as he possibly could. Well, yeah, it's true. from the outside, you know, looking Right, in. that's true, yeah. Uh, and let's see, then, do you, you don't have outgoing sender link here, do you? Oh, but we do. But you do. Oh, <laughs> so, we, you can't hear it. Let me dial, I have an MF to our three crossbar. Oh, I didn't know you could dial across to there. Yeah. Three, two, seven. One, three, four, six. MF sender. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wait, I don't want to hear this. Yeah, you don't hear the MF, though. No, it's five bar. You're not supposed to. One, three, four, six. Uh, 
totally cool. That's us. You don't have any... Do you have any trunks from there back to here? Uh, not as such. No, we don't. Yeah. Okay. That's a future project. Cool. Okay, so there's another one you can try. Right. 334. 334. 334. 2930. That's us. That's the, uh, that's the CX. CX. Yeah. Cool. So there's, that's, 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 this is a little bit interesting. We'll see if this will work. Can you dial the num that number again? 2930. I don't know if that will work or not, but that's me making it do 20 pulses a second. Oh. <laughs> but the North doesn't always get too happy with that. Yeah. Well, Jeff was telling me those relays are pretty reliable. So yeah. We need it's probably happier than step switches would be. Yeah. We need, we think, I was talking to Dave Thompson earlier, we think we can maybe tweak things a little bit so it, it will actually accept 20 reliably. You probably could, but you don't have to because it wasn't in the real world that way. Well, I think they did it some, certainly it's a standard feature of the dial pulse senders to make them go at 20 PPS. Ah, good. In okay. fact, well, so, yeah. what I, so what, what I did was, is a, is a, there's a, it's a cross connect on the root relay that you can send, you can say, you know, certain information. And one of the things you can cross connect is, is, the, is some class information. And one of those is 20 PPS versus 10. And all I did actually was just operate manually the class relay, and it just it locks oh, once cool. you so operate it. It's in there already. It's oh yeah, it's all in there. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. So can you use that to call here for a minute? How do you mean? So oh I mean, call, oh call yeah me, call me yeah sure. Um, let's clear that. So KP6016. Okay. Now now release the connection. Just want to see what happens here. Oh. Yeah, I believe there's a, one of those thermal relays on the incoming mm -hmm. trunk as well. There was a hack that nobody else knew about mm -hmm. that we discovered. I wouldn't say it's broken until Yeah, yeah, there it goes. Okay. Yeah, you got dial tone. Do that a little more time. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the standard incoming trunk circuit. Well, let's see, was there... What do, what do I need to know about the outgoing sender link as far as that? How that works? Oh, yeah, it's, it's fairly simple. It's very but. simple, actually. It, it's, it's like the incoming, it's just a single stage. Um, and so the trunks are on the verticals here, in fact... You know, when this office was in service, somebody demoed the trunk numbers on here so they could see what was going on. And um, the the horizontals, so you could have up to ten senders, uh -huh, okay. which was actually the maximum number of they have sender groups. So you have a group of MF, you have a group of dial pass, group of referred pass, group of PCI, whatever. Um, and ten was the maximum number of senders you could have in one group. If they needed, for instance, if they needed more than 10 senders, 10 MF senders to handle the traffic volume, they'd be divided into two groups, and one group would handle one set of trunks, and another group would handle a different set of trunks. Okay. But I don't know that there are really very many cases where they actually had to do that. Um, the senders are actually divided into two, uh, st each group of senders has a two subgroups, an A and a B, and each subgroup is served off a different connector. And again, the marker has, will, will alternate between the two subgroups on every call. Okay. So if it's the middle of the night and nobody's making calls, and you come along and there's a bad sender in one subgroup, 
yeah, the next it'll choose the other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, there's a lot of stuff like that. And within each subgroup, again, they'd use the sequence circuit to sort of randomly pick one so things would get spread around as much as possible. Where are the relays? Now, your customer hears the sound of being connected to a trunk, but he usually will hear dead silence right. until the outpulsing is over. Yeah. And then there's a double tick. Where's the relay that does that? that well, there's a relay in the, in the trunk. Um, and that's in the outgoing trunk, sir. Yeah, I think it's the D relay. Um, uh, that basically switches the outgoing tip and ring pair between the sender and the, the telephone line uh -huh. that you're calling from. And when it does that, when it's to the... When the when it's to the sender, there's still something, the customer's tip and ring right. is connected to something that can detect the customer hanging up. That's right. So there's actually, um, there's a battery feed in the, in the trunk. Right. And the battery feed always goes back to the customer. I see. On the out, you know, it's a... Oh, so the customer is just connected to battery and nothing else. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So if you wanted to make a trunk... MF audible, you could put little capacitors on the D ray. Yeah, we've that's, that's how we did it on the three cross. Bar. Oh, that's how you Actually, did it. Yeah, cool. And I, I, I did it on this. I with clip leads, so I wasn't going to leave it there. But I had a couple of caps with clip leads across the appropriate contacts on the. I think it's the D relay. And uh, yep, you can hear it. Let, let me, um, let me make a, a, a. Let me tell you what I would experiment with if I had time. Yeah. The, uh, the crossbar tandems, usually if you were coming in on a wire trunk, mm -hmm. would allow you to hear the MFs. Right. But it had a tinny quality. Yeah. It was so tinny that Bill Acker had to, could, in order to use that on the network, he had to turn around and put a capacitor across the output in order to right. get it back down to normal. Yeah. That tinny quality has always sounded to me like the exact same tinniness mm -hmm. of the circuit that lets the incoming of a number five crossbar allow the, it lets the caller hear the called line while it is ringing. Mm. There's an attenuation so that you're hearing, yeah. you're actually hearing the phone line through attenuation. Right. It's the, in my, in the opinion of my ears, it's the same tinniness. Mm. So one thing I'm interested in knowing is, what is the what is the incoming trunk? How it through what is the incoming trunk connected to a called line while it is ringing? To on a five cross by a couple of capacitors, I'll tell you exactly what's going on. Yes. So the the ringing signal um, is um, has the the twenty hertz component. And the tone. And the tone. Mixed together. So basically what they do is there are a couple of capacitors. There's, there's, a, there's a relay with um, transfer contacts. So if you were the, the cord line looking back in at the trunk, you would see you're on the armature contacts of this relay. And when it's, I forget if it's operated or released, which way around it goes. But let's say it's released to ring. I know, I think it's operated to ring, so it operates, it gets operated. And that then connects your line to the source of the ringing supply via the ring trip relay. Right. But then there's capacitors around the other contacts of that relay, so the signal is fed back. Right. And you hear the audio tone component going back. Attenuated and tinnified. Yeah, because they're like... 0.02 or something like that. So it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of high frequency response and not much low frequency response there. What I would like to try is the next time you want to bypass a D relay so yeah. that the caller can hear the MFs, right. try using the exact same capacitor okay. that is used with that. Uh -huh. And then see if it has that same tinny sound that mm. crossbar tandems have. Of course, you'd have to hear the way my tape sounded. Right. Yeah. But uh, the long distance series you know, starts yeah. out with that. Wire trunks into crossbar tandems are designed to either let you hear it or not. Mm. And the ones that let you hear it, it always has a very specific tinniness. Mm. Okay. And so they've, they did it on purpose. 
and not all trunks have it. Huh, interesting. But they definitely did it on purpose because they all have that same tinniness. Hmm. And, it, I mean, it's completely the same. No, no variation. Wow. Huh. And it's, it's pretty loud. And I think it goes back to the days when they had direct distance styling and they wanted to, you know, make a big deal about it. And mm -hmm. They had a whole ad campaign, our machines sing to each other. And, right, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So specifically, the crossbar tandem examples where you hear the tones very clearly, mm -hmm. where the dial pulses sound very like a, you know, they sound real clicky. Mm -hmm. you know, that high pitched clickety clickety. Right, a lot of ringing at the end of the pulse. Yeah, yeah. clickety clickety click, like almost like you're winding a watch backwards. Yeah. It sounds to me like they put the same capacitors. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, across their equivalent of the D ring. Yeah. Uh, as as the ring, they 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 attenuate it the same way as the as the. Oh, that's the interesting. Ring. Yeah. That's what I think huh. from the recordings. Well, I have a theory about the crossbar tandems actually, and I ought to make it true for the number one crossbar as well, but I don't know that it does, or maybe it does. I don't know. Um, which and, and this is the th and again, it's just a theory. On crossbar tandem, you have a trunk, and so when the sender is in the picture, you go through the sender link into the sender. Both the incoming side and the outgoing side of the trunk are temporarily diverted to go into the sender, yeah. right? Yeah. So they're going to be in the same cable, and there's capacitance in the yeah. cable across them. And I'm guessing that that's how you're hearing the tones. For the specific cases where it's quite audible mm -hmm. and tinny, I think it's the same. That could be the same. The same attenuation, right? As as the incoming, uh, hmm. the incoming ring. Yeah. But you know, as far as the other crosstalk on crossbar tandems, yes, it's very likely that. I yeah. Okay. Here. Yeah. In number one crossbar, yeah, there are at least three different generations of the of the senders of the right. originating senders. Right. And none of them sound like a crossbar tandem. Okay. The third generation lets you hear the outpulsing clearly at a low volume, mm -hmm. but it isn't really tinnified. Mm -hmm. The second generation senders do not let you hear the outpulsing at all, mm -hmm. but you hear a lot of relay gonging along with MFs, mm -hmm. and you'll he you will hear revertive pulsing if it's in the same office. Okay. So what you're saying there may apply that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's 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 a, you know it's a powerful you know. Yeah. Powerful voltage. The first generation ones, uh, they just vary too much. Well, that's all the Crossbar 5 functioning related discussion that we had.